let's say our hypothesis is right that Homo naledi was deliberately disposing of its dead. Few people have realized that's probably 200,000 years before we even are suggesting humans do that level of behavior. That's incredible. You talked about the second chamber when second lot of Naledi bones were found and you said um, that you'd found they were tucked away in niches. So that's been published, has it? Yes. yes. But you said, I can tell you now, we found more evidence of that. No, well, I, we found more evidence of Homo naledi. Yeah. So okay. what, we, what has occurred is we've originally found the Dinaledi chamber, yeah. which uh, had that incredible number of fossils in yeah. it. We then found the Lissetti chamber, which is 110 meters away. It's the same species, exactly yeah. the same, but the, the situation is slightly different. The three individuals that we found in that yeah. uh, chamber appear to be up in alcove. Now, we don't know whether that's because a floor yeah. has been removed yeah. and that they are just by chance in there or that they are actually in those alcoves. And that's yeah. what we're working on right now. Okay. And then we found multiple other occurrences okay. of hom Homo naledi throughout the system. Okay. The last count that I have is uh, over two dozen individuals of Homo naledi, which is incredible uh, yeah. if you think about that. And what's, what's interesting about them is that they're all the same. They all look alike. Yeah. They look just like each other. And so that's very unusual for hominids. If you think of hominids like the ones we discovered at Dibonisi, those hominids were very variable, even though they found five or six yeah. different individuals. Each one, some people said, were different species. Yeah. These are all exactly the same. And that may mean either that Homo naledi was like that, or that this is what true populations of hominids look like yeah. and that the other ones have been scattered over time okay. and maybe we aren't looking at actual populations of hominids. Yeah. Uh, what we need though is another hominid species in this kind of number to actually figure that out. As I understand it, Naledi is a weird mosaic of very ancient looking uh, features and very modern looking features and, the eye, and I, uh, that might be because of interbreeding between a very modern and an ancient species, is that right? One idea could be hybridization. Yeah. Or it could be that this hominid descends from a very ancient ancestor that's maybe primitive to the entire genus. That is, that could this be the stem of our genus? Now, that's a possibility. Uh, and then things like Homo habilis and Homo erectus, uh, they spin off of this, maybe even the hobbits in Flores uh, spin off of this. But, um, that doesn't explain a lot of the very advanced features we see in Homo naledi. There are features in Homo naledi that are only seen in modern humans and not seen in even things like Homo erectus. So how do we explain that? And the answer is we don't have an explanation for that right now. We're working on molecular studies, trying to get things like ancient DNA, uh, proteins, and as you know, the science of proteinomics is advancing uh, very rapidly. We have high hopes for that. That may answer that question. One of the huge problems, which is a good problem to have, but it also is very difficult, is that Homo naledi is now one of the best represented hominids in the entire fossil record, probably outside of Neanderthals. And so to compare it to a very fragmentary record that we're unsure wh whether all of those are the same species, they're often very variable, but if there's a Homo naledi there, with its mosaic of features across its body, some primitive, some very advanced, how would you recognize it if you only found small bits? How do we know there aren't other species like it or different from it that are constantly contaminating our record that we assumed was one record? And that makes paleoanthropology very difficult now, but I think also very exciting. It means we have to get back and look at old collections again and we need to find new fossils, more fossils. On the note of finding more fossils, I read your book. Unfortunately, I put it on Kindle edition, so I can't get you to sign it. Um, <laughs> you can sign in front of your iPad. I want to quote, <laughs> I want to quote John Her yes. Hawkes at the end. So you take him to a site that isn't uh, Malepi, I think I've posted that right, Malapi, yep. and it isn't Rising Star, and you give him a block, he turns it over in his hands, I'm quoting here, two teeth caught my eye, or quoting him rather, 
The bone of the jaw that contained them was strong and robustly built. I glanced up at Lee, who simply stood watching me examine the ancient hominin jaw, an amused look on his face. I said what we were all thinking, here we go again. That was 2016. Now you don't, you, you get things done quickly. So what was that? That's another hominid site we discovered. Okay. And that we are in the process of opening up. One of the things that happened to us in between that discovering that discovery and uh, and and actually digging into it was a lot of other discoveries. We haven't stopped exploring. And what when when this all started, and I never dreamed something like this would happen back in 2008. You have to remember that you could go your entire life and never make one of these discoveries. Not even a piece. Not even a tooth. And. It, Yet now we're in this period where it's exploding, where we're finding that these things are not as rare as we thought. We were often just looking in the wrong places, or for some reason we were looking with the wrong eyes. And so now we have multitudes of discoveries, multitudes of early hominid discoveries at different sites. Um, a lot of them are very difficult to work. They are sites like the more traditional sites, so the material is embedded in very hard rock. Um, a lot of them are, uh, we're just waiting for the right young scientists to come along that we funnel in to do that. Field work is both very difficult, very time consuming, and very expensive. And so building those groups around that. Um, that site uh, is, is uh, people are fairly familiar that we have a, a major another hominid discovery. Um, that's not a that's not a secret amongst the community okay. of paleoanthropologists. It's just in a very very difficult and very unsafe situation. So you have another major hominin discovery. Yes. A new species. I don't know yet. You don't know if it's a new species. Um, it's from... not. I will tell you this. I can tell you this for very long. Yeah. What we're looking at is not Sediba, and it's not Naledi. Uh, could it be, um, as it robustus? Could it be any of the? Um, it 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 could be. Uh, it maybe. I don't know. We haven't got them out of the rock yet. As I said, the situation therein is very different from any other situation that um, we've made a discovery like this, uh, and so it's a very dangerous situation. So we're still working out how to stabilize that situation before we actually extract them. So all I have is a, a glimpse of several of the individuals and that they are not very tiny. John alluded to that in talking about yeah. a robust mandible. And, and so that jumble of bones that you, um, you showed in your talk, where's that from? So that is the remains of Carabo, the holotype of Australopithecus sediba. Australopithecus sediba is the yeah. fossil hominid from Malapa. Yeah. Um, when we originally found uh, the first specimen, that was a skeleton, um, we actually ran a competition for children in South Africa to name it. And they named that skeleton Carabo. Okay. And it was, in and of itself, one of the most complete hominid skeletons ever discovered, more complete than Lucy, um, as complete as, as some of the best fossils that's ever been discovered. Um, we found those other remains from the site. Uh, in, my wife was doing her PhD, she's a radiologist, but also was doing a PhD in paleoanthropology on pioneering CT scanning of blocks. And in, in scanning a very large block in a medical CT scanner, we made a discovery. We discovered that the block was full of skeletal remains of a hominid. And so for the last couple of years, we've been preparing this large block down to yeah. reach the first layer of hominids, but we know there's more material there. Yeah. Now we don't know if that material is the remains of Carabo or if there's another hominid skeleton lying underneath it. And we've just delivered that block to um, Lockheed Martin in Dallas, Texas, and it is being CT scanned with a custom CT scanner that's usually used to scan things like missiles mm -hmm. and engines, and it's being scanned at very high resolution as we speak and that's two million years old. Two million, one point nine seven seven plus or minus one thousand five hundred years. Talking of uh, new technologies, so Naledi, say two hundred thousand years old in a cave, 
that's a prime candidate for having DNA and protein signatures. Absolutely. So what's happening on that front? So we tried a first round of uh, ancient DNA extraction using bone, uh, mm -hmm. which failed, but, but that's not to say it's not going to succeed. Ancient DNA is, is advancing almost at the speed that Moore's Law is, and the, the, uh, and those were only bones that were kind of randomly selected. We also know there are other types of bones, other areas of anatomy that can give us extraordinary results. We were sort of waiting for that technology to mature and also to discover more and other specimens so that we could select different types of preservation. Um, we have not run proteins yet, but will. And of course, proteonomics is the new ADNA. And I have high hopes for uh, ancient proteins in that material. It's of course well within the grasp of ancient proteins. And given that these bones don't even look like fossils, you know, they hardly look fossilized, um, I think there's a very good chance. I wouldn't bet against within the next five years or so that you hear about ancient DNA and or proteins um, out of Homo naledi. And when we do, that's going to be very exciting because it will, it will answer the question, the questions that we all have. Is Homo naledi related to us? Is Homo naledi that elusive species X that interbred with modern humans in Africa around 200,000 years ago? Is Homo naledi another thing that is related to us and not species X? And how is it related to us? Is Homo naledi not related to us at all? That would almost be more remarkable. And yet Homo naledi is so primitive, it would be remarkable. It, it, there's no, no answer that's not going to be striking within that. Now we do know there are large brain hominids in Africa, at least in the very north of Africa in Morocco, Jebel or Hood, at 350,000 years. And we know that the date on Naledi is about 230,000 to 330,000 years. We don't have a very precise date on that. So we know that large brain hom hominids and Homo naledi coexisted on the continent. But did Homo naledi ever meet Homo sapiens, or maybe more appropriately, did Homo sapiens ever meet Homo naledi? And if so, what happened? We don't have an answer for that yet. Well, every time modern humans appear on the scene, other species seem to disappear of humans and, and hominins and other animals. Could it, I mean, one hypothesis is maybe modern humans um, brought about the demise of Naledi? Um, I, that, of course, is a possibility. Uh, I would just point out, though, that with new DNA studies, what we're finding out is they don't all disappear. And there's almost always some small introgression of DNA that, that, that gets captured by Homo sapiens. And maybe that's our trick. Maybe we just keep breeding ourselves into the better mousetrap, uh, as well as being uh, not such a friendly encounter for, uh, for other species. Uh, remember this, and this is really hard, and I think even paleoanthropologists often have a hard time getting their minds around this. We know that there were earlier populations of Homo naledi. We just don't know how early they go. It almost certainly wasn't the last occurrence of Homo naledi. When did a thing like Homo naledi go extinct? A lot of times everyone has a picture in their mind that every time there's a new evolutionary development in our story, that we wipe out the previous story. But that's not the way biology works. It's not the way evolution works is simply human arrogance, and even scientists today propagate it. The only thing we absolutely know is that we're alone today. But when did that alone happen? It probably wasn't very long ago. Probably most species that existed in the past existed for much longer than we have previously given them credit to. We know for sure that in the last couple of hundred thousand years that humans have had the input of at least three extinct species and likely more into our DNA. DNA analysis has shown the, there was a mystery human X that yep. bred for us. Well, there's Denisovans. Yeah. They've intergressed with people in Indonesia, some people in Asia, um, and then there's, 
there's um, uh, there are Neanderthals, and they've integrated a little bit with with uh, people in Europe, Asia, China. Um, then there's a, a species X that exists in Africa, but we don't know what it is. We just can see the markers there, and it's suggested it occurs around two to three hundred thousand years. And you do have Homo naledi there, two to three hundred thousand years. And if I were trying to be a sort of arrogant scientist and claim, you know, a place for this, for Homo naledi, I'd say, well, there you go, you've got Homo naledi. But Homo naledi also has another message of caution for us. If it could hide from us, if it could remain an invisible from us for likely millions of years as it existed in parallel to all these other things we're finding, other things could too. There's more out there to find. So what about the possible links between the, the uh, and I've got a, like my pronunciation probably on flor, floriensis, floriensis. floriensis right, yeah. and that's very small, primitive yet modern human being, lived very recently, do you think there could be a link? So I, I think that we have two possible links for floriensis. I think Sediba is not a bad candidate ancestral species for that. Um, we've said that before in papers. Um, Floresiensis has some things that are primitive to Homo naledi, and it well, or they're very derived in a very odd manner um, because they are not like anything, like the foot uh, and the wrist uh, morphology. But and and Homo naledi has very advanced feet and wrists. Uh, Sediba might be a better kind of candidate for that. A early Homo naledi could. Um, I think what we're pretty sure is that floresiensis doesn't come out of Homo erectus. Okay. And so you need it to come from something that is as primitive as Flores or as primitive as uh, Naledi or something else. So we've got these amazing symbolic discoveries in, sure. South, in, in South Africa. Yeah. We've got the etched ochre, we've got um, um, etched shells. And we assumed they were the product of our big-brained um, Homo sapiens. You're saying? Well, I, I'm saying that one of the truly disruptive things that archaeologists now have to face about Homo naledi is a very clear one. You've got to have the evidence to make your argument. And we have been assuming that there were only large-brained hominids in Africa in the last 500,000, 600,000 or so years. Suddenly, we have found a small-brained hominid that's primitive, that's not a human, not anything like one of those large-brained hominids. And it's sitting right there in the middle of southern Africa. Around it is a plethora of archaeology that we call the early Middle Stone Age, that almost every archaeologist uh, from those working at Pinnacle Point to Vunderwerk Cave to uh, the coast of, of South Africa, other coastal sites in South Africa, say that industry is the origins of what will be the complex next stage of the origins of modern human that's going to lead into this explosion that's happening after 200,000 years in symbolic behavior, in complexity, the invention of what I've often called the infinite toolkit. What if we got that narrative wrong? What if Homo naledi is doing all that? Now, probably a lot of archaeologists, the moment I say something like that, will go puce and grab their heart and say, but we know modern humans did that. And my colleagues and I say, well, show us the evidence. We've already claimed that this is a site of deliberate body disposal. What I think a lot of people may not really understand is, if that's true, then Homo naledi is already operating at a level that we're not claiming for Homo sapiens for another 200,000 years. It's already operating at a level that borders on the symbolic likely. And we studied the endocast of the brain and published that and said that Homo naledi has one of the most complex brains we've ever seen. It's got Broca's area in the areas of speech, it's bilaterally asymmetrical, it's got a lot of complexity that we've only ever seen in brains the size of humans. What if Homo naledi actually had cracked that code of how to be smart with a small brain? You know, humans 
are just now finding out that we've been wrong about almost everything we thought about the uh, neural capacity of other animals, I mean bird brains, which are tiny, operate in a very different way, and they are extraordinarily complex. We're seeing that with the study of octopus. Let's say we're, our hypothesis is right. Let's say our hypothesis is right that Homo naledi was deliberately disposing of its dead, maybe in varying complex ways, like we see in the Dinale chamber, like we see in the Lissetti chamber. Few people have realized that's probably 200,000 years before we even are suggesting humans do that level of behavior. That's incredible, if it's true. The fact that there were two different types of, appear to be two different types of disposal, one putting it down a chute, one putting it in little niches. So there's not just, you've got two, have you got any more than that? We have those kind of two types and there may be other evidence we're working on right now. Okay, can you tell me about that? Nope. Okay, so there's, you do have other evidence but you can't talk about it. The very fact that as, during the expedition itself, only hominids were coming in. I was a vertebrate paleontologist by training as an undergrad and you know, I, I've studied animals all over the world and I know what zoologists and paleontologists mean when they say monospecific assemblages. They're never monospecific. You talk about a wildebeest drowning site or a bison jump site or whatever is a monospecific thing. There's always other stuff. There's either the stuff in the catchment area. They're there with fish bones and crocodile bones and all this other stuff. Are there zebra in the middle of it, but only a few or, you know, there's always other stuff. There was no other stuff. They were alone. Um, and they're really, invertebrate, terrestrial vertebrate mammals, that's so rare as to be almost unheard of and yet completely common. And it's completely common in humans. Why? Because we spend all our time trying to explain why we're separate from nature. And so did our ancestors. And all of them did it in the past. They saw themselves as separate from nature and separated. They didn't want bodies going, undergoing those uh, natural processes for whatever reasons and th that does vary but it's almost a universal truism in human behavior into the relatively deep past where we know they're humans. So if it's true in Homo naledi then it's astounding. So you've got the, the initial cave you found with lots of bones and then the next cave you've got that what appear to be cached in, in niches. They are in, in holes in the walls. Holes in walls, okay. And you've got something else which you can't we talk about. We have other sites with Homo naledi and we, I have something else I can't talk about. Um, to, to do with Homo naledi? Yes. Um, to do with its disposal? <laughs> I'm not going to go there. We are going to talk about some relationships based on discoveries we've made. I mean relationships with other species and we are also, um, we have other sites. So other sites with possibly other human species in them? Yes, either known or unknown, yeah. An unknown. So relationships. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm not going to okay. Tell you. So you have got evidence of, 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 of there is relationships. We believe we have strong evidence what? of at least a relationship with Homo naledi, and that will be big news. Well, thank you very, very My much for talking. My pleasure. To I never got round to any of the basic <laughs> stuff, but anyway. Okay, thank you. Yes, ever so of much. course. It was such a delight to you. My pleasure. You.